<laughs> Here's the culprits. Okay, so yesterday we spoke about the difference between Kohanim and Levim. That Kohanim are associated with Chesed and Levim are associated with Gura. And it has to do with the Aveda that we see in the base of English. The Kohanim, their Aveda was cool, calm, and collected. They did what they did. It wasn't loud. It was quiet. The Levim, on the other hand, they were the ones who were singing, either with musical instruments or vocally. And the singing, of course, was to arouse the people that were there with spiritual inspiration. When did you sing? Did you sing like if you were in like, like in this in the I think it was during the carbon, especially when they were, I think it was during the pouring of the wine, they used to pour wine, Nisuch Hayayin, on the Mizbeach, and during the carbonus, while the carbonus are being brought. Every day? Every day, yeah. So, he explained that the difference is, the Abed of the Levim is Kuvura, because uh, the singing was a fiery love, the kind of love that you have to struggle that the body should contain the soul because the person is so much on fire. And the Kohanim, their love is more that calm love where the soul and body are, remain connected and it's actually bringing the soul into the body. While the Levine was as if the soul is rising out of the body to something higher. And therefore, We'll soon say the words inside again, but therefore the Levium, they were already Gubura, which means the light, which was reflected in their Aveda, was going out of the Kali, out of the vessel. And therefore, to add more Gubura to that, more Tsimsum to that, could lead to negative results. This would be similar so the few stories that we know, one of them are the two sons of Aaron. The other is a story with the four sages that went into the Pardis, where it says that they were overcome with such love for Hashem, with such fire of love for Hashem to the point that they expired. Then Hashem actually left their body and they died. The Gemara says there were four such sages, uh, Rabbi Kiva and Elisha ben Avuya, Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, four sages. Three of them had negative results. One of them lost his mind. One of them lost his faith. One of them died. And Rabbi Kiva was the only one that went into this in a healthy way and came out in a healthy way. And that means that is a possibility for this. That's, that's what we say that it's a mode of going upwards. The soul is sort of withdrawing from the body, that's Kavura. And therefore, if you add more to that, these are the kind of negative results that could lead. If it's too much, if it's excess Kavura, then the soul, God forbid, could leave the body. Body is something negative comes out of it. So in our context, by, by the Levim having hair, this hair is connected to Kavura, and there are, they are already Kavura. This would mean too much Kavura, and that could lead to negative results. So let's start again from page 126. Now we'll read it sort of smoothly. And it's two lines from the bottom. This is the reason. The Levim were commanded in the desert. Pasuk says they should pass a razor over all their flesh, which means they have to cut all the hair which also means, by the way, the hair of the bear, the hair of the payas. These are things that it's a mitzvah to let it grow, but not by the levy, they had to cut it. 
Kidarkon the Iluchum Bakaidesh Ubkinis Islavus. Their approach and their path of divine service was characterized by this fiery love to Hashem. Page 127. Ukles Hanefesh, no, 129. Yeah, 129. That was the Kabbalistic question yesterday. How you get from 127 to 129. To the point that their souls could would expire rising above their bodies. And if anything, they needed to make an effort. And it was a struggle to make sure that their souls are contained in their body because they're in the up mode. This was their Aveda every day reciting the song of the day through singing. And this song, this was really not just a song, this was their fiery love to Hashem. The Rebbe explains this in more detail in Tanya chapter 50. Since their divine service is about their soul rising out of the body, away from the body, which means the light of the soul is shining less in the body. That's symptom. In the earth, it's So the light that's left in the body is a more limited light. Being that the soul primarily at this point through this fiery love is sort of lifting itself out of the body, then it's just a little bit of life flow that's left in the body. In Cain, ye am shachas menashima ersha bekli. Ye meze ye nikachitzen. So this could lead to external forces being able to derive their nurture because right now, this is what's happening. The nisham is not, the light of the nisham is not shining in the body. So the body is more vulnerable now and therefore the clippers could get hold of it. And the same principle applies to Mitzorah. Pisa, Yuvangamke, Mitzvah, Tegalachas, Mitzorah. Again, we're explaining you the way it's explained according to Kabbalah. So the next line is like pure Kabbalistic terms. Let me just read it. Kibyeis ha Mitzorah Muchlet, the Mitzorah that's supposed to be sort of uh, locked away because he's impure. Because part of the process is that we're not sure in the beginning whether this is going to be impure or not. And therefore, it has to be examined once and examined again. You have to wait seven days. But mukhla, this word means once he reaches the point where he's absolutely impure, what causes it spiritually? And explains that there's a certain light, basically, to make it just brief and short and to the point, so it's easy to follow, is that the light of Chochmah is not shining. And like we said the other day, when the light doesn't shine, when it gets dark, that gives room for all sorts of negative things to be present. So Tmarosam, instead of this light that was shining before, what comes out, what grows on the flesh of the person? Se'es, Eisapachas, Eibeheres. The blotches of Tzaras, these are three different kinds of of uh, sort of things on the body that emerge. But what are they spiritually? Dinim takifim. Really, this is severe judgment, which means this is uh, the light of Hashem becoming more hidden now because the Chachma left. And this white hair, the hair that, the hair that grows, that's a sign that it's Mitzorah, is white. So this white hair now becomes the source of nurture for the clippers. I'm not sure if I'm correct about how the science of it works, but I was thinking the other day, yesterday, as we finished this class, you know, we we're saying, okay, so if a woman cuts her hair, covers her hair, and what does it mean, the connection to Atika Kadisha? And the answer is because everything down here is connected to up there. So I'm thinking every day we use our iPhones. We use a GPS. How does it work? I know there's a satellite over there. How many miles away is the satellite? A gazillion. A gazillion. Okay. 
And there are satellites that are even a chachillion miles away, much more. <laughs> and I have this device in my hand. When I punch into my device, does that do anything to the satellite? Is it connected to the satellite? Yeah. And does the satellite send signals back to me? Yeah. And that's, so I, I'm standing here and I want to know how to get to a place in Manhattan and I punch something in and it appears with all the instructions, directions, a right turn here, a left turn there, all the details, how did that happen miraculously? So the answer is I did something here, activated something in the satellite, it sends me signals and now I know what to do. So it's almost exactly the same thing. Somebody would say, I don't say, how is that when you put your finger on this thing, all of a sudden you get directions how to go here, there, or more complicated functions of, of, of devices that work with satellites, much more complicated functions. And the answer is what I do here does something there. When I do something there, it has an effect down here. And think of it the same way spiritually. So if I cover my hair, up there something's being covered. And as, as a result of that, it protects the clipper. And if I uncover something that's supposed to be covered, then it does the same thing up there. And when something happens up there, it sends signals down here and it's all interconnected. In fact, that's why Hashem created all these devices. So you should be able to understand the Hasidus better. Without that, it would be much more difficult. But if you think of it, we're so used to it. And at least some of you in this room grew up with it, but not the people like myself. And every time I see it, it's still fascinating when you think of it that, that you are uh, look at this thing and it gives you exact, precise directions how to go and tells you there's traffic on this street and traffic on that street. So take this route, that route, the other route to the, to the detail is incredible, but it's something that's higher uh, up there has connected to all the, through the satellites exactly what's going down here, sends me signals and now I know what to do. But it's a it's a it's a it's an interaction that I do something here, it affects something there, that sends signals here, and that's what happens Baruch, and it's exactly with Twilin, Mezuzah, Kiddush, Havdalah, everything. Mahem Yankin Machakachitsen. So this white hair that grows on my hand, it's it's a white hair. I would say it's not any more significant than the device that I'm holding in my hand. But the Torah says, no, this white hair is connected. So things up there, and that's where the clipper gets its highest from. Last line on page 128, the second to the last line, and from this, I they say love, and the say love and becomes this white hair is like a pipeline that provides sustenance to the clipper. As long as this person is considered impure according to Torah. It's Tava, the person's commanded, he's not allowed to cut this white hair that's growing in the blotch, on the, in that, that spot on the skin. Why? This is actually one of the 613 mitzvahs. Mitzvah 170 is, do not cut that part that has that, the person might think, oh, this is the problem in my body. These, these, uh, the skin that's not normal hair, I'll cut it off. I'll cut off the hair. Hey, Muzar, and the person's also commanded, other signs of impurity. As it says in Mitzvah, Tafko Gimel, 583 is another Mitzvah. Why? A person might think, the Yitzvah, the intent of this is, person might think, maybe he'll chop off, he'll cut off these signs of impurity. If this white hair is a source of sustenance for negative forces, let me cut it off and they won't have that sustenance. Yeah. Um, just, to, just to reiterate, in the Torah is a person with leprosy. Yeah. And what's Saras? Saras is the same thing. That's the white. No, I think Mitzora is the person and yeah. Saras is the leprosy. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. The this means Shalaidama bin a person shouldn't think. Lahavar Yunik is saying that the way he get rid of this um nurturing that the clippers get is by Yakut Simonatuma, just cut off. So this is the pipe that's giving them life force, it's giving them uh, vitality, I'll cut it off. 
Vidame benafshay, and a person would think, Shebefrida is simen zeh, when I separate this sign from the external forces, matchay he pushes them away, he rejects them, that they can't get any chayil because I'm cutting off their pipeline. Don't do that. That's what the Torah says. And what's the Torah's reason? Ki chas v'sholem yizgabr page 130. By doing that, not only you won't gain that you'll weaken the external forces, you'll actually be provoking them to be even stronger. Why? Hashem does not approach his creation demanding of them more than what they can handle. So therefore, when Hashem creates, whoever Hashem creates, he creates them and he provides them with their sustenance. So Kishem Shemafan is called Tzvah Maila Hakadoshim. Just like Hashem gives sustenance to all the heavenly hosts that are holy, all the angels that are positive angels and holy angels, He also gives vitality and sustenance to all the klipa because they have to do their job. They were created for a purpose. This is the way it's going to be until the end of days, meaning until Mashiach comes. Once Mashiach comes, Hashem will eliminate all klipa from the world. But until then, they have a purpose and therefore Hashem is demanding of them to do their shlichas, their mission, so he gives them life. So being that according to the laws of Torah, according to the dictate of Torah, they, it's coming to them, they need to get this sustenance, and that's why this happened with this person. For whatever reason Hashem chose, it says in Gemara, it's because of Lashon Hara, that Hashem chose that the Klippis are now going to latch on to this person. It's a little bit like, in fact, they are compared to, to um, bloodsuckers. What's a bloodsucker? It latches its on to itself to the body and it sucks out the blood. And it lives from the blood that it sucks out of the person's body. The Klippis are like bloodsuckers. They latch themselves onto a person. And the only time and the only way they can latch themselves onto a person if he does an Avera. In this case, it has to do with Lush and Hara. That leads to these uh, different conditions growing on the body, the hair and all the uh, skin changes. And the clippers, they are able to nurture from that. Number one, it's from the person's neshama, from the soul. Also from the source of the soul, from the satellite up there. So we have a soul down here. And we have a satellite up there that's sending signals to my soul and we're connected. So the clippers down here get highs by latching on to me and they get their nurture from the source up there. And for whatever reason, I did something that caused this condition and there's nothing I can do about it. You can't, um, you can't uh, cut it off from them because they have the right at this point. And if you cut this off, this would actually cause them, like I said, it would provoke them to fight even stronger and to do more damage spiritually. It's an interesting because we're talking about clippers, but the mentality or the reasoning and the logic is just like you would deal with a person who is um, acting in a negative way or a child that's acting in every way, you have to find a way to discipline this person or this child that it's not going to sort of provoke them to do even more and do worse things than, than, than they need to do. Right. Yeah. This is the one, the Cohen, the Cohen, the one that So, so what, what do you mean? What are you explaining that what? Well, he's, he's probably, he's probably more into what's going on, let's say, besides... Uh, right. Also, I think that you brought it up already, there's one a very interesting halacha about the Mitzorah. How does he become uh, pure? The Kohen has to come, and he has to announce that he's pure, has to say the word that he's pure, and then he becomes pure. And the Kohen has to see it and, and, and give that pronouncement. Why is it? Because the Kohen, he embodies this light of Chochmah that we're talking about that left this person. And therefore, only he, when he comes back, 
and he associates with the person, looks at it, and declares it pure, his very presence brings back the light of Chachma to the person. And when the light of Chachma comes back, then the klipa is removed. But not in a way that you're forcing it, which means that in general, let's say you discipline, I started to say, if you're disciplining a child, you have, or uh, you're disciplining a person, or you want to discipline a country that did something wrong, in all cases of discipline, has to be extremely cautious and measured that you're doing it in a way that you're going to accomplish something, not in a way that you'll provoke the other party to do something even worse. If you remember, we mentioned here, what? The current is what? Less likely to get Saras. Less likely, but he could get Saras. Right, but it's strange. If he embodies the light of Chokhmah, how could he ever get Saras? But apparently it's possible for him to do something that's going to be so such an obstruction that he's going to conceal the light of Chokhmah even within himself. Remember we mentioned this halacha that when, when you're going to war against an enemy, the Gemara says you should only attack and surround the enemy from three sides and leave them one route of an escape. Why? This is the same principle. If you don't leave them an escape route, which means you're not, you're not giving them even a chance to escape and live, they're going to fight back with such intensity in such an aggressive way that there'll be more casualties than there has to be in this war. And again, the gamble was also with a child. When you're disciplining a child and you find that the child has a list of 10 things that are negative character traits. This child is disrespectful, the child is lazy, the child is cheating, the child is, um, is, is arrogant. And you can't try to fix all 10 things at once because then you're choking him. And as a result of that, he'll fight back so aggressively that you'll make the person even worse. So the way to do it is in a way that you're disciplining them and they're realizing what they have to change, but not in a way that you're going to provoke them to become more aggressive. So in a sense, the same applies even in the spiritual realm. There are klipas. Hashem is giving them chayas through these methods. If I go and I just cut it off, not, not, not with a, an orderly fashion, and I say, okay, I cut it off, they can't live anymore, that'll make them even, provoke them even more to fight even stronger. And, uh, and they can do more spiritual damage. So therefore we have to wait till the time passes, whatever time is necessary. And then the light of Chochmah comes back in and then the Klippa leaves and then, they, then, and then the person can go on. So this is here on page 133. By actually giving them that which is due to them, it causes them to be satisfied and therefore, they won't be more aggressive to grab even more because you're satisfying them. You're giving them something. The Zer gives this explanation in relation to the, the goat that was sent on Yom Kippur. The same thing with the calf who was related to what has to be done to a calf when there's a, a murder that we can't, we can't solve who murdered the person. And that's why it says in the Torah, be extremely cautious and careful. Do not do that. The real proper way to remove the sustenance that they get, remove the nurture that they get, is not by chopping over their heads, but by me doing tshuva. And when I do tshuva, I will draw down the meich and the abba, this light of chokma that left me. And once the light of Chachma comes, then they themselves will just leave. Then they, just like with light and darkness, that when there's darkness in a room, you don't take a bat to beat up the darkness, and you don't take a vacuum cleaner to pull out the darkness, and you don't take any other method of getting rid of the darkness. You just shine a light, and when you shine the light, the darkness naturally uh, um, is removed. So once the light of Chachma shines, and what causes that? Tshuva, because it was my Avera that made the light of Chochmah leave. When I do Tshuva, I bring that light back. Then the Torah is saying that in these circumstances, Klippa can't come here because it's too much godly light. 
And this is done through the Kohen. When the person returns to Hashem and he becomes healed spiritually, and then there's no longer any <coughs> nurturing from this from this hair. Then there's a mitzvah to do the opposite, cut the hair. Even though the person's already been purified, he's already in a good in a good place. We call Malcolm Cyrus Elo. This hair, the hair, which is what's left over, the, the clippers could still have some nurturing from it. Came dinim kosher because they are a result of what was going on before that the light of Hashem was concealed and hidden, and that made them um, made, made it made them possible for them to draw a, a nurture from there. The sip is cut and because the light was very little, and there was no kedusha there. So now. But now that the light of Chachma returns, after you finish cutting off the hair that was related to them, then it says you're not allowed to cut the pace of the hair, you have to let it grow, and so on. So basically, there's a certain principle here, because the next part of the mimer is going to take this principle and applied something very practical. It's very, it's very interesting to just watch because the, what we're talking about is Atika Kadisha, Orin Sof, the hair, things that are very, very spiritual. But you'll see that after establishing this principle, we'll see how extremely practical it is in the way we serve Hashem and our daily lives. And that's the next piece of the mind, the next part of the mind. So what is the principle? The principle is that when you have something that's very high, like or in soft infinite light, then the Cyrus is a positive thing. And when you have something that's not like that, and then you add even more symptom, then it becomes a negative thing. The principle is an objective principle, and it's a principle that is could be and should be applied to everything and anything when, when you think of the, the principle itself. And it's not just related to here or that, but the principle itself could relate it to how we're supposed to live in this world and how we're supposed to lead our life and live a life that's going to be balanced between heaven and earth, between trust in Hashem and yet going to work and doing all the things that a human being has to do in the natural order. Rabbi? Could yes. You, hi. Could you just repeat what the principle is again? So the principle is that when you're dealing with something like Kedusha, a very high level of Kedusha, a very high level of wisdom, like Shlom HaMelech, or we're talking about the level of Oren Sov, the infinite light of Hashem, in these cases, then the hair, which is excessive tzimtzum, is a positive thing, because that enables the infinite to connect to the finite. But when you're dealing with something which to begin with is not uh, something that's very high, it's already in a mode of concealment and it's hidden. And then you go ahead and you add more than what's necessary, then it becomes excessive symptom and that could lead to negative, gives Klippa more life than they should have. And as a result of that, this would be the answer to all the questions that we have. How come sometimes hair is positive and sometimes hair is negative? Whenever the Torah says that it's positive, like the beard has to grow or the pears have to grow, that means that it's connected to that level in, in, in the spiritual realm that's infinite. And over there, the hair is an advantage, not a disadvantage. Wherever the Torah says that hair is negative, that means it's connected to a place in the spiritual realm that the light of Hashem is already hidden, concealed, contracted, goes through symptom. And now the hair, which is excessive symptom, could lead to negative results. That's the principle. I'd like to say it in less words so it's more clear what the principle is. But uh, should I do that? Should I try that? Or it's clear? Try it again? Still don't got the principle? Okay. So let's, let's go over the definition. Again, the definition of hair is excessive symptom. Excessive concealment. Yes, Nama. 
I mean, isn't it just the principle that everything down here is connected to something up there? So in case the pair is positive, it's connected to something good up there. And in the case it's negative, it's connected to something bad. Okay, that's principle number one. That's true. So what was just said here, you, you probably can't hear it, is that first principle is that everything down here is connected to what goes on up there. And therefore, when the Torah says something about hair that it's positive, because it's connected to hair up there that's positive. And when the Torah says something about hair that it's negative, it should be cut or should be covered, that means it's connected to something up there that's negative. But now, what are we explaining? What, what could be up there, positive or negative? This is the answer. If it's a hair that come, which again, what is the definition of hair up there? If there's no physical hair. So the hair means excessive symptom, excessive concealment, extraordinary concealment. So if the extraordinary concealment is concealing a place that's infinite, it's positive. If the ex excessive concealment is from a place that's already concealed, then it's negative, then it's too much. Why would it be good to conceal the infinite? Because without this excessive concealment, the infinite light can be transmitted and, and can provide life to the world because it's too it's infinite and it's finite and there's too much of a distance. Okay. So it has to go through an extreme symptom to allow infinite light to be transmitted to a finite world. But if the light isn't infinite, it's finite and it's already contracted, it's already limited. And then I go ahead and I add excessive symptom to that, then it's too limited and it's too, too much hidden and it leads to the negative. Yeah. Um, you know how you said you're supposed to like have all the hair and the twins? The hair is dead. Like, why is that? We it's spoke about in class, hair is not dead. The fact that it grows means that it's alive. <laughs> it's also dead, dead and alive. Yeah. I, I guess hair, hair is a <laughs> sign of tears and mason. It's dead and then it becomes alive again. <laughs> it grows back. It has which strength. <laughs> No, generally speaking, hair is alive and it gets life from the, from the body, from the soul. But the life, that's what hair means. It's a, it's a place in the body with the life force and the life flow that's in hair is so contracted, is so hidden, is so concealed, it's as if it doesn't exist. That's why we say hair represents, it's a metaphor for extreme, out of the ordinary symptom. Esther, did you follow that? Yeah. We have two Esthers. Yeah, okay. Three? Whoa, one, two, three. Ruffles of Esthers. Okay, by the way, what does Esther mean? Concealment, right. But it's the positive concealment. <laughs> Okay. So, so Rabbi, if that's then women's hair is in a light. Not, it's not that woman's hair is negative. It's, it means that uh, 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 the hair of a woman is connected to Malchus, to the sphere of Malchus. And over there, you need caution that it should only transmit a limited light, but not more than the it should. So therefore, it has to be covered to make sure that only the right a sort of recipients get the light, the life flow, not the wrong recipients. Has to be caution. Okay. Really, we should just go over some of the terms that we spoke about. So hopefully, we'll remember this, and it can come in handy when you learn another mimer. Maybe we should do the questions. We have five minutes. There's questions on page 47. But there's also a little chart on page 48, a, 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 a paper that just gives us more clarity. Look at all the, look at all the differences. There's Nazir, look at page 48, just it should be clear. 
Nazar, during the period of Naziras, it's a mitzvah to let the hair grow. Nazar, after the period of Naziras, the hair must be cut. Then the third thing is Nazar, during the period of Naziras, if it was canceled because he went, he became impure and he has to start all over again, the hair must be cut before he begins to repeat the period of Naziras. That's one category, Nazar. In the Nazar itself, there are three situations. Then comes Levium. Not now, but during the time of the Midbar, it was a mitzvah to cut the hair. Then we have Mitzorah. Same thing again. After the Mitzorah period is over, for the process of purification, the hair must be cut off. During the Mitzorah period, it's prohibited to cut the hair that's growing in this lesion. The married women, the hair must be covered. Men, the beard and pale should not be cut. These are all the examples. And it has to do what, what it's connected to in the spiritual realm. Now, in the spiritual realm, it's all Kedusha. It just means that when the hair is sort of attached or added to a certain level of Kedusha, then it could become a source for Klipa. That's what it means. Um, so let's look at page 49. It's also a summary of what we did. This is just a summary in case you want to have a picture of everything. On top of the page, it says symptom. What's symptom? Contraction and concealment of light. Hair, which in Hebrew is cyrus, means excessive symptom. Here is the overflow of energy coming from the brain. So a casual conversation of a genius Torah scholar, so a casual conversation is Torah. A casual conversation of an ordinary person is negative. Nonsense of a genius Torah scholar, nonsense in quotation, that in itself is Torah. But nonsense, which means just ordinary idle talk of an ordinary person is literally nonsense. Humor of a genius Torah scholar is Torah. Humor of an ordinary person is just negative. A mushal given by a Torah genius is a necessity. It helps communicate the concept. A nushal given by an ordinary Torah scholar is not necessary and therefore it's confusing. And then when we go to the spheres, Cyrus of Atika Kadisha, which is infinite, those here, that here is Kadusha. Cyrus of Malchus, which means it's already in a Tzimtzum mode, could lead to unique lichitzenim, the nurturing for the clip. Why is Tzimtzum soul? What? What is someone's soul? What happens? What's his hair connected to? Like he said, overflow energy coming from the brain. So, like, what does that mean? Yeah, I just realized that I see, like, Tons of people who are bald on the street, like they don't shave their head, they're just bald. Right. I've never seen a bald rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> but like they just grow hair. People are bald patches. There are plenty of bald rabbis. Oh my gosh. Yeah, they, they say that somebody was once reading a book. <laughs> my a husband's a bald rabbi. What? My husband is a bald rabbi. Oh, <laughs> Okay, we found the bald rabbi. The GPS is working. They say that somebody once was reading a book and it said that if your beard is longer than a tefach, a tefach is this much cubic, then it's a sign that you're a fool. So he reads his book and then he checks out what's doing, puts his hand on his beard and there's a whole big piece sticking out. That means I'm a fool. So he doesn't want to be a fool. He takes a match and he lights it and waits till it burns. But when it burns, it hits his hand. So he lets go and starts burning his beard and his face. He jumps into the water to get the fire out. He's a mess and his beard is singed and he looks like, like he, like he, uh, yeah. So he takes the book, writes that on the side, proven by trial and error. <laughs> that is actually a fool, yeah. But I don't think there's such a book. This is just a story. But, Thank you. Have a good show.
So if anyone has any connection to any big rabbis and you want to verify, ask them this question. Why is there a difference from the Hasidic perspective? Why is there a difference if this is what hair is and what it's connected to between a married woman and a woman's not married? And you bring back the answer to the classroom. Extra credit, Extra credit right. <laughs> Rabbi, yes. Please, can you send me the question of the Maimer, please? The questions of the Maimer you don't have? No. Okay, I'll speak to Ms. Yaffe. Yeah, sorry. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Have a good job. You too. Rabbi, I wrote down a quote from your class today. Which is? Hair is the overflow of energy coming from the brain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can draw math. <laughs> so there's more intellectual energy in the brain than in the hair, hopefully. <laughs> okay, thank you. Have a good Shabbos, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.